<laughs> so I wanted to move on to a topic that Mukoma raised, um, topic of language. This afternoon is entitled Decolonizing the Mind, Two Generations in Conversation, and we're obviously having the two generations in conversation, but I wanted to focus a little bit on um, this notion of decolonizing the mind, which is the title of one of your works. Uh, the issue of language has always been a, an important issue that you've written about, you've spoken about the fact that um, rather than in, in Africa, rather than having the colonial language be the language of education, we should be using local languages. And uh, with your writing, for example, the, the last book that you, novel that you published, um, you published it first in Kikuyu before uh, you translated it into English. And I wanted just to spend a few minutes talking about the language issue. Um, you know, what your thoughts are now? Are you encouraged? Are you disheartened? This young, the younger generation of writers, your family, your, your daughters and sons included, what are your thoughts on the, the language issue? Well, I'm always challenging more common than the others too. Uh, about that. Oh, rather, it's not challenging. We debate the language issue. Uh, at home. And of course, you know, our very home exemplifies the problem itself, and he can talk uh, for himself and the others about that, you know. But still, we, I still I feel, feel so strongly about the language <coughs> issue, not merely in terms of sort of writing itself, or it has important, you know, but in terms of self conception, you know. Uh, of Africa, and it's you know the last, what last month you and I, my younger sister, and I went to Leeds University, where there is conference of uh, scholars of African African scholars I mean, in the UK, where African studies scholars or something, so the historians and others, and they also invited a few people from um, scholars from Africa. And since Leeds, my old university, I was invited there as a keynote speaker on the, on the language of African scholarship. And I asked them, I was just, you know, at first I was playfully asked them, oh, uh, by the way, since we are all scholars of African history, politics, and so on, you know, how many have written a, a book in any African language? And there's no take. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many have written a paper in an African language? In the African language? There's no take. How many have written a page? <laughs> <laughs> and there were, I think, three people raised their hand. So I tell them, look, can you imagine somebody say, I'm a professor of Italian whatever? You know? culture, renaissance, or history, or art. And he does not have a word of Italian. You know? So that kind of thing can bring out the absurdity, really, of the African situation. And it's affected not only, of course, you know, uh, the scholars outside Africa. I'm talking also African scholars themselves, you see. And so, so many absurdities go on in this situation, very, very sad. For instance, a scholar, not all of them, will go and get information, they get they do field work, you work, they get informants. Those informants may very well know a local language. So they go, they interview the original information, but they, of course, they translate that into English of the scholar. So what has been translated to English becomes a primary resource. So, you never, so the actual words, or the ones near to what was spoken by the original informant, of course they are thrown away, generally. I did ask them about that, and a few said they retained them, but most do not even retain the original information. So the, the, this means that the study of African history the study of African ideas, the study, the, even the very self concept of Africa, is completely abnormal in my view. You know? And so I've been told, really, I'm more concerned with this abnormality 
which has somehow been some strange kind of thing, has been turned into a normality. It's abnormal, absolutely normal. You know, why well, can be a professor? If I went, now it's the current of distinguished professor of English and uh, uh, comparative literature at, the, at uh, you know, at, uh, California, you know, California, Hawaii. But I'm sure if I had applied for that job, oh, and I went and told them, no, no, I don't have a word of English, but I still want a job or promise of English. <laughs> I mean, they would, I don't think it would even have, I don't know what would have happened. You know. <laughs> Let's say it would have been very unlikely. Okay? <laughs> but but it, it happens in the case of Africa, it's a norm. So it's absolutely abnormal. And it's, it's a colonial thing. It's a colonial thing, colonial distortions, which have been turned into some kind of normality. So this is really essentially this is what I've been struggling uh, against. Well, I, I think to embarrass someone in the audience, we have No Violet Bulawayo who spoke here uh, a week or so ago, and she going to get some interference with the Blue Angels in a minute. Um, she writes in English, she won the King Prize, but she also writes in Indibetan. And one of the things that really struck me as I, I, I was interviewing her as well uh, was looking at her blog and looking at the way that the languages speak to each other. She was writing a follow-up to one of her stories, and the responders were writing in languages that were not in English. So I'm sort of interested in the potentiality, I think, as well, for this internet world in which we live to maybe foster greater discussion than writing in other languages. Just trying to add a bit of hope here. For me, the way I've approached the language question is, um, is thinking about translation. <coughs> um, you know, and that, that in, my, in my thinking, that there, are, there are three kinds of possible translations. One is from, uh, from English into African languages. No, actually, the, the one that's most common is one, you know, Papa was talking about, which is from from African languages, whether it's through knowledge or scholarship into European languages. But I also think that there will be more fruitful translations from, uh, from European languages into African languages. But equally importantly, or maybe even more importantly, translation between African languages. Um, you know, because there are ways in which, there are ways in which we speak to each other through, through English, you know, um, even you know, through English philosophy, but also through English language, um, and consequently, there are things we don't see about each other as Africans, because our languages are not talking to each other. You know, for example, you know, a set of poetry is absolutely beautiful poetry. You know, it's as beautiful poetry as any poetry I've read anywhere. Um, but that poetry doesn't get uh, translated into Kiswahili or Kikuyu. So there's a war, right? There's a war existing between, you know, the Basoto poetry and, uh, and uh, you know, and you know, Kenyan literature, for example. So that's one. The other one is, I do think that we should be uh, scholars of the history of English language, right? And one of the things that we find is that uh, that first English used to be a language of peasants. That in fact, the same debate we have now of African languages was also a debate that the English people were having, you know, during Joseph's time, right? You know, back in the day, so English used to be the peasant language. The language of elite, the elite, the language of social mobility was uh, French and Latin, right? And what happened eventually was that, you know, the nobility realized that, no, to, you know, to rule of our peasants, we have to speak their language, right? Um, and if you keep following the debate, you know, then you get to the woods war, you know, whether they are talking about the language of men. And, you know, by talking about the language of men, he meant let's use the English uh, of, of the people. So there are ways in which you can take that debate and, 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 and transpose it over, over the African language debate. But I do find it fascinating that while we see the battle against English as this uh, impossible uh, mountain to surmount, that actually English itself had to fight for survival. So in, in that as well, there is hope. Um, but to go back to, the, to, to, to your question of, uh, of the internet, yeah, I, I do think you know that sort of uh, that sort of immediate translation um, is, is important. 
Well, while we're talking about the internet, I will... Let me just come in because it's a very, very, very important question. I'm sure that many of you here will probably pass it on. The, of course, the problem is not just writers. Let me just, let me just hasten to say that. It's not simply a question of writers. African governments have themselves come up with educational policies in Africa. Let's not let's forget about the colonial and what they did. You know. But the African government themselves, most of them are silent about African languages. And even where there is some kind of tribute paid to African languages, you know, resources are not put behind African languages. In fact, in many African languages, where during the, like in Kenya, where during the colonial times, I was lucky to have gone through school and learned the coil up to a particular uh, grade. These days, as the, the, the Kenyan government came with the point, no, English, you must start <laughs> English even before one is born, if it's possible. We can't report this like that, <laughs> literally. Yeah. So all the resources are put into English language programs, of some of the French programs, and Kiswahili also, but it doesn't mean a positive element. But otherwise, no resources are put into African languages. In South Africa, where it's a very positive language policy, but even there, I was there last year and I was arguing about the same thing. I was saying we must have, if African languages are going to make any movement within the continent, then they must be part and parcel of linguistic power sharing. You know, just now they don't have any power, leave alone resources. There's no advantage in knowing even a hundred African languages, you know. Someone who knows half African languages and someone knows, say, French and English, the French guy and the English guy will get employment anywhere. Eh? But the one who knows half languages, you know, those become like a burden. So it's much more basic than the question of writers themselves. Yeah. Can I add one more thing? You know, because today we are with, uh, with James going to a bookstore. You know, we went to a bookstore uh, on uh, Hate Street, right? Hate Street. You know, and he introduced me to this photographer, you know, and the photographer has, the, the, the cover photograph is of, a, of an African judge, right? He's dressed in a black gown, white gloves, uh, actually red gown, uh, white gloves, and, uh, and a blonde wig, right? <laughs> you know, and when you go to his court, of course, the language of the court will be English, right? But for, for me, that captures the sort of, sort of, at some point even, ridiculousness, which would be funny if it didn't have such tragic consequences of ruling, you know, making rulings that the people you're judging against can understand. You know, but it does come to the ridiculousness of that. Why, why is he wearing a blonde wig? You know what I mean? You know, and, and then you, you, you think about all the years, you know, that particular judge has spent in school, all the amount of sacrifices, you know, only to sit on a chair, you know, a, a caricature of, 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 of the work they have done. Yeah. And lastly, in, in connection with the international aspect of it, you know, like today in Africa, or I mean other places, you get, even international organizations have owing to this, sometimes they offer prizes, you know, for to promote African literature. The specification is that that African writer must write in English. So, how can you, oh, honestly, it's just like saying, I'm going to promote, I don't know what French literature, but they might write, write it in Zulu. <laughs> I mean, you know, but it's going on all the time. And then it's called African literature. Of course, it's fine, they're doing very, I mean, the actual writing itself is excellent. I'm not quarreling with the writers themselves, by the way, but I'm saying that whole empowering, conscious, negative disempowerment of African languages and conscious positive reinforcement 
of English, you know. And I, in fact, was, I was in Tanzania one when I recorded with one of the donor organizations because they said that in Tanzania they were trying to make Kiswahili, you know, promote Kiswahili and so on. And this particular donor was saying, you know, we are promoting now uh, Tanzania literature, so it could be and the condition is that they must write in English. <laughs> okay. I don't know. So, language we can see is a, is a big uh, issue. And I want, I'm also conscious of time, so I, I want to ask one more question before I open it up for other people to ask questions. And while still talking about language and politics, here's a question that I'd like to ask. Because you're from Kenya, because you've written this lovely book, Dreams in a Time of War, which I highly recommend. It's, it's, it's beautifully written, and um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. And I, as I was reading it, I was also looking at what other people had written about the book, and I noticed that there were several reviewers who had uh, compared it to Dreams from My Father by the president of this country. So I wanted to ask a political question related to US politics. There are some politicians and polit political commentators, the likes of Newt Gingrich and Dinesh D'Souza, who say that Obama has a Kenyan anti-colonial worldview, <laughs> and that this governs the way that he rules. What do they mean by that? When you invented on democracy, now when Newt Gingrich said that, when you invented on democracy now too. <laughs> yeah, I kind of oh, Yeah, I was, I, I was responding to this. But, you know, what's wrong with being a Kenyan? <laughs> I mean, thought of it as something, it's like something criminal in being a Kenyan. <laughs> or I see there's something, something bad about being anti colonial. I mean, it's <laughs> 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 so something, something evil or something. <laughs> An American about being anti-colonial. <laughs> then, in fact, who is being anti? Who is being an American? It's probably the person who is saying yeah. that being anti-colonial is bad because at least America at least gone through a phase of things where partially they were <laughs> anti-colonial. Anyway, I find that very. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a whole way of thinking. I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. How somebody can think that being an anti-colonial is necessarily a disqualification or <laughs> of, I don't know. Yeah, right. um, yeah I, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, it, during the Kenya crisis, during the, the post electoral violence in 2007, that was happening as well, you know, when the, when the right wing was trying to tie Obama to the, to the violence, you know, and try to say, you know, he's a cousin or related to the, you know, to the, to the perpetrators of that violence and also the prime minister, as if, you know, I don't know, it's as if Africa was sort of, you know, Africa and Kenya was sort of bringing him down. It's as if that would actually disqualify him. You know, but since we're talking about politics, I just wanted to go out of topic, you know, and say something that's been really disturbing to me about Obama, and that's the use of drone attacks, right? I don't know if, if you have read the latest, uh, there's a, a report that was just done through the, uh, by the, by the New York University and another university, in which they talk about uh, the amount of fear you know, that the Pakistanis are living under, you know. Uh, but more than that, you know, some of the designation, I, I guess this actually proves it's not anti-colonial, you, know? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, but some of the designations of, uh, you know, tweaking language, so anybody who's killing a drone attack, the U.S. is no longer responsible to prove they're not militant. It's up to the, it's up to the people, I guess, who have been killed or they're keen to prove that they, that the, the people they have killed are actually not militants, right? So, I, I don't know, for, for me, I'm finding that to be a very, very, uh, it, it's a big problem because it means in the U.S. you have to think about, you know, are you for the domestic policy? You know, are you for, well, do you think you would be better off uh, under, under Obama or Romney? Or, or, or how would the international scene, you know, it's as if you have to divide between the domestic and the international. So I'm going to interrupt you now because I know this conversation could go on for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Obama is going to be talking about foreign policy. Let's see if anything is raised um, mm -hmm. next week on Wednesday. I wanted to ask one last question, though, which has to do with writing before I open it up to everyone to ask questions, which is, I'm sure there are writers here in this audience, as 
part of the Lit Creek Festival. There are a lot of writers all over the place, which is wonderful. Is there advice that maybe you offer each other as writers that you want to share with writers here? Or is there advice that you would give any budding writers in the audience about writing? I have one which I always give to budding writers, especially, you know. Because writers who have started writing, they know the joy of it, they know the trial, the tribulations, and the highs and the lows. But for those who want to be writers, as you guys in the audience, writing is actually very simple. So I'm going to give you a formula. <laughs> so you can write it down. <laughs> Write, write, write again, and you will get it right. <laughs> um, I, I disagree. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm joking, actually. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, for me, I like uh, James Baldwin's, you know, um, sort of a parting word in letter, is it letter to my nephew? where he says what he wants to do is to, to be an honest man, you know, but to be an honest person uh, and, to write, and to write well, right? And, and I agree with that. I, I do think, you know, that, that we do have a responsibility to write well, of course, uh, but I do think we also have a responsibility to be honest. And by honest, I don't mean that, you know, you're morally right or wrong. I think to be honest means that you allow yourself to you know, I don't know, to be vulnerable to your own writing, you know, that sounds cryptic. So I'll go back to write, write. <laughs> 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 